got Instagram going. Uh, Facebook's about to get going. All right, now their Facebook is going. Okay. So, uh, as usual, skip forward to the part where you see me lift up the Bible study. That's where we will start. I'm currently going to give people time to join. So, if there's somebody on Instagram that's joined. Um, I can never tell when anybody on Facebook joins, so my apologies if you're saying anything. I can't see it. Because um, I'm doing it on the computer, on Facebook, on Instagram, I'm doing it on my phone. So with that being said, people are starting to join. Let's go ahead and pray and dive right into the study. Um, today's study, tonight's study rather, will be the goal of the godly. This is lesson 20 in the Landmarks of Prophecy series. We have four more studies after this. We will try and do <clears throat> probably two or three tomorrow again, and then we'll probably finish out Monday or Tuesday evening with the whole series. So let's pray and continue on. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being with us. Thank you for the truth you have revealed in your word. And in, in spite of all the naysayers, Lord, your truth, your word stands forever and it is eternal. Forgive us for our sins that we may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And please give us the Holy Spirit that we may understand the lesson tonight and what the goal of your people should be and is. In your name, amen. So, our story tonight comes to us from Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 to 75. Um, Peter was very boastful. He was very much a person. He spoke what he thought and he didn't think before he spoke. Um, and so, now, that said, Peter loved Jesus. He followed Jesus with all his heart. He, he did the best he knew how, but Peter was very impetuous. He was very uh, impulsive. And um, even at one point, Peter told Jesus, he says, you're not, you're not going to die. You're not going to be crucified. And Jesus had to rebuke him for saying that. Uh, and then on this particular night in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus told Peter, he says, you're going to deny, to deny me three times. And three times, Peter denied Jesus. Do you know this man? No, I don't know him. Surely you're this man's disciple. You, your accent matches up with those who follow Jesus. No, I don't know him. Sure, surely you know this man. And he called down curses and used foul language to try and convince the people that, Pe that he, Peter, did not know Jesus. Now, as soon as the rooster crowed, Peter re remembered the words of Jesus and the prediction that Jesus made that Peter would deny Jesus three times. And he, he was heartbroken and, and sorrowful and depressed. And he ran back to the Garden of Gethsemane and he wept. Um, now, uh, the, what I love about this, about the Bible, is that I cannot remember the exact verse, but it's in the Gospels. When the rooster crowed, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. Not to say, I told you so. I told you you would do it, Peter. You, you, you idiotic person. No, that's not what Jesus did. He turned to Peter, and he had this look of absolute love and forgiveness in his eyes. And I believe that is what broke Peter's heart and made him so repentant. And when Jesus resurrected and, and told Peter, feed my sheep, Peter was a new man. And forever onward until the day of his death, Peter served God faithfully the best he knew how. Um, now, uh, as far as our questions uh, go, are we going to be like Peter in his repentant state, or are we going to be like Judas in his non-repentant state? That's uh, pretty much what we're going to see tonight, okay? Uh, how does God determine whether or not we are on his side? You see, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, the Bible says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. <clears throat> uh, Matthew 7 goes on to say, uh, that Jesus will say to those Christians who are in the lake of fire, Depart from me, I don't know you. Um, and it's, it's, it's one of the most sad texts in all of Scripture. In fact, I've got a sermon on my YouTube page that I did on that text called Will He Know Your Name? So if you go to my YouTube page, you'll find it there. Just look for that title, Will He Know Your Name? Um, it is one of the sermons that I have felt the most conviction to write. Um, and so... What determines whether we know God's and whether God knows our name? Uh, Romans 6 
gives us the answer. Verse 16, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants uh, you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So how does God know our name? When we are so in love with him that we obey his law. That's how God knows our name. That's also how Satan will know our name. Because, um, for example, in Acts, the seven sons of Sceva, uh, they tried to cast a demon out of man, and, the, and they, those demons said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who on earth are you? And the demoniac attacked those sons and beat the tar out of them. And so Satan didn't know who those guys were because they didn't follow Jesus. Why does it matter that Satan knows our name? Um, because if we follow Jesus, then we've got a big red target on our back because Satan wants to destroy us if we're following Jesus. That's why. Now, when the commands of God and men conf conflict, who did Peter say we should obey? This is well after Peter's conversion here. This is Acts chapter 5, verse 29. And this was when Peter and John were on trial with the Sanhedrin. They were trying to force these two apostles to 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 try to force them into quit preaching the gospel. And notice what Peter said. He says, uh, Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And what made Peter so strong in that? Well, he had fallen in love with Jesus. Before, he, he loved Jesus as a good teacher, as a man, but not really as God. And the difference is, I can love my wife, but unless I love God, I'm not going to be able to be the best husband that I can be to her. And Peter was not the best apostle that he could be until he fell in love with Jesus as God, as the Savior of the world. So how do we best demonstrate our love for God then? The Bible says in John 8:31, Jesus is speaking. He says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Uh, John 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. 1 John 2, verse 4 says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So, the best demonstration that we can give that we love God, that we love Jesus, is simply obedience to him, to his law. So many people take scriptures out of context and say, for example, Romans 9 and 10, they say, The Bible says, Only believe, and you will be saved. Yeah, that's the beginning, but that's not the end. Um, belief leads us to obedience. Just as James chapter 2 says, faith without works is dead. If we're going to claim to know Jesus, then we need to obey him. As 1 John 2, 4 says, if we claim to know Jesus but we don't obey, my friends, we are nothing more than liars, and the truth is not in us. I can say that I love my wife all day long, but if I'm going to go mess around with other women then do I really love my wife in that instance? No. But because I love my wife, I truly do love my wife, I'm not going after other women. It's the same with Jesus. If we love Jesus, we're going to obey him. It's a love issue, my friends. It's not a legalism issue. We need to quit crying legalism when somebody preaches obedience because God commanded obedience. If you love me, Jesus himself said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, according to Jesus, why did the hypocrites act religious? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, uh, the Bible says that they may have the glory of men. And a few verses later, in Matthew 6, verse 5, that they may be seen of men. These hypocrites, these false Christians, act the part because they want to receive the glory and the honor of being a good Christian, right? Um, they, they don't want to be Christian, they just simply want to act like it. Isaiah prophesied of these people, and he said that in that day, the end times, seven women will take hold of one man, saying, uh, we will eat our own bread, we will wear our own clothes, only let us be called by your name to uh, take away our reproach. In other words, they wanted to look the part, but not act the part. So, is it generally safe to follow the crowd like that? Exodus 23, verse 2 says, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be which find it. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20 
says, In the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved. So you see, historically, the crowd nearly always makes the wrong decision. So um, maybe your parent, if you come from my generation, then very often parents, uh, people who were parents of my generation were like, if people were jumping off a cliff, if everybody was jumping off a cliff, would you do it too? Um, it's kind of that issue. Uh, the crowd is never, the decisions that a multitude makes is rarely ever the correct decision. And so we should not follow the crowd. Remember, it was the crowd, it was the multitude that screamed out, crucify him. And there were only a very few who hid in the shadows and were opposed to the crucifixion. Now, how does Jesus feel when we put the traditions of men before the commandments of God? In Mark 7, verses 7 and 9, uh, the Bible is quoting from, I believe it's Isaiah. He says, "How Jesus is speaking, how be it in vain do they worship me? teaching for doctrine the commandments of men and he said unto them full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition so anything we do that is an excuse to disobey God whether if if we know about the Sabbath and we refuse to keep it then we're keeping our own traditions if we know about idolatry and we still worship idols and, and pray to the Saints we're keeping our own tradition right and it could be and there's so many other different options and, and ways we could say this but the fact is when we put our own ways and our own feelings and thoughts and desires above God and claim that we're still worshiping him then Jesus speaking here applies to us when he says how be it in vain do they worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men Jesus says don't reject the commandments of God so that you can do whatever you want and still call it worship right that's not okay it's not biblical and those who know better and still do that cannot rightly call themselves Christians now will true Christianity be popular in these last days and the, the world hates anything that calls them wrong so will true Christianity be popular in these days is it now all we've got to do is look at the news uh, and see but let's look at the Bible because that's where the real answers are Matthew chapter 24 verse 9 Jesus is speaking and says you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Why? Because you're preaching the gospel. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So what we're seeing the Bible tell us so far is that Christianity is not going to be popular in these last days. It happened in California. I mentioned this in another study last night, how California tried to force preachers to accept and endorse the LGBT lifestyle. Another state tried to force preachers to turn in their sermons to be screened. And, 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 and this is the United States, folks, the supposed land of religious freedom. And that's only the beginning. What else will happen? In Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was wroth, extremely furious with the woman, that is the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Revelation 13, 15 says that, that the beast, the second beast, which we learned is the United States in Revelation 13 shall cause that as many as should not worship the image of the beast should be killed so in these last days my friends the Bible is telling us that if you truly live the Christian life Satan has it out for you Satan does not give a, a single care if you call yourself a Christian but don't act like it he does not care in fact he loves that because he can use those people more easily than he can use unbelievers, open unbelievers. Uh, because people see inconsistent Christians and then they reject the gospel because of those inconsistent Christians. Um, and so if you truly live a Christian life, you will be hated by somebody around you. You will be persecuted by somebody around you. Could be in person, now that we have social media, could be online. But the point is, you will be hated by the world because Satan will try to take you out one way or the other. So popular Christianity, and I said that wrong, Christianity will not be popular in these last days. Biblical Christianity is not popular. Never has been. It never will be. Popular Christianity is not biblical. It is not real Christianity. And how do we know the difference? Simply by testing them against the Word of God. Now, is it possible to serve both God and the crowd? Can we follow both ways? Matthew 6, 24, 
Jesus again speaking, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. In Matthew 12, verse 30, it says, He that is not with me is what? Is against me. So in this battle between Christ and Satan, there is no such thing as neutral territory. If you are not actively surrendered to Christ and serving him, automatically you belong to Satan. There is no middle ground. There is no gray area. It's black or white. It's righteousness or evil. Is it safe to love a friend or family more than Jesus? What does Jesus say in the Gospels? In Matthew 10:37, Jesus says, He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. If we love anybody more than Jesus, my friends, that's idolatry. In Luke 4:26, Jesus again speaking says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. It doesn't mean that I have to tell my wife, I hate you every day. That's not what Jesus is saying. It's simply another way to say, if anybody loves anybody more than Jesus, that's idolatry, and they are not worthy of Jesus. If we don't love Jesus more than anything else, we don't love him at all. That's what Jesus is telling us here. In Matthew 12, verse 50, For whosoever shall do the will of my Father in heaven, the same is my mother and brother and sister. Jesus indicates here that the best way to help reach and save our loved ones is to put him first in our lives. You know, I have met people who say, I don't want to be baptized until my family is. But my friends, the best way to be the example and to get your family to accept the truth is by living that truth and by living all of it. Whether they want to be baptized with you or not, do it anyway. Um, and that's the best witness that you can possibly give is simply living the character of God in front of those around you. Not for show, but to because you love Jesus. Now, is it wise to put a prosperous career or earthly treasures before Jesus? What does the Bible say? Matthew 16, 26, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In Luke 12, 15, A man's life consisteth, consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. It's not a sin to make money, to have a house, to have a car, to even have a nice phone or computer. It becomes a problem when those things become priority over Jesus. Um, you know, I know some wealthy Christians, right? But they're lovely people. They're lovely people. They're not the arrogant type that 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 other people can be. And that that's what it's all about. When when God blesses us with stuff, it's for the purpose of helping others. It's not to hoard it in and out to ourselves. If I stockpile my kitchen with food that is so much more than I could eat by myself, eventually a lot of that food is going to go bad. Our blessings are meant to share with others. The blessings that God give us should not be idols. There's a cliche that normally I'm not a big fan of cliches, but this one is true, and it goes something like, one of the reasons that the world is in such massive trouble is because people were meant to be loved and things were meant to be used. But, people, but the world has flipped it on its head and the world loves things and uses people. And, and so God doesn't want that. He hates that. And he wants us to love people. He doesn't want us to idolize anything over him. Now, is it safe to continue disobeying God's will after he has shown us the truth? Many people believe in something called once saved, always saved. And that simply is not biblical. Um, Doug Batchelor has a wonderful video. You can search it up on Facebook. Just search Doug Batchelor, once saved, always saved. I'm sure it's on YouTube as well. And he explains it rather well why it's not biblical but many people claim that because it makes them feel better about their sin and they that way they can buy into the deception that they don't have to change that they can come to these truths and just say eh doesn't matter but what does the bible say hosea 4 verse 6 the bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge i also will reject thee seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy god i also will forget thy children so here God is, is very plainly saying that if we persist in sin when we know better, then, then, then he says, my people will be destroyed for lack of knowledge. It, it's, and it's not those who struggle with sin. God can work with struggling. 
What God cannot work with is cherishing sin. I've said it over and over again, and I'm sure I will say it hundreds more times throughout my lifetime uh, on this earth. Is is that is you know, if we put anything before Him, that's an idol. Hebrews 10:26. If we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remains no more sacrifice for sins. If we cherish sins, God cannot work with that until we're willing to repent. What will happen to those who persist in rejecting the truth? Second Thessalonians 2, verses 10 to 12, gives us a very sobering and serious warning about that. It says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The reason that they are buy into the strong delusion in the end times, the reason that they perish is because they had pleasure in unrighteousness, Paul is saying, and because they loved not the truth. Um, John 3 verse 19, And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. So John 14, 6 tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But many people don't want Jesus because he condemns their sin. Because he tells them, you got to give that sin up if you want to follow me. Many people will study these, these studies and they will come up to, the, yeah, that's beautiful, that's great, that's beautiful. Well, I don't like that one, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not interested anymore. Um, and it happens way more than you think. And it's, it's, it's sad because you want people to be saved and, and something happens and a lot of people give up these studies. Um, you know, what will happen to those in the end time? Will those who persecute God's people in the last days believe they are doing the right thing? Jesus told us himself in John 16 verse 2, Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God a service. So there will indeed come a time when God's people will not only be persecuted but killed for their faith, and those, those murderers will think that they are the servants of God. They'll think they're doing God a favor. Now, how did Peter describe those who have learned the truth but refuse to follow it? In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 and 22, he says this, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after that they have known it to turn from hold the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb that the dog has turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. You see, once we hear the gospel, then our level of accountability has been raised to what it was before. Acts 17 says God winks at our ignorance. So long as we don't know any better, God can work with that. God can respect that. God is willing to work with you. But when we hear the truth, Peter's saying, if we hear the truth and we reject it, then it would be better that we had never heard it at all. Because there's a certain level of responsibility. Now, um, I used to be a school bus driver. We, we lived in Illinois for four years. I was a school bus driver there for a little over two years. And it was a great job. I loved it. Um, but one of the things that really irritated me was um, when I would put my lights on and my stop arm would extend out, and it had red flashing lights, I still had people drive past it. Now, um, unfortunately, when it happened to me, there were no cops around to pull these people over. But these people know the law, and therefore they have a higher level of accountability. So that when they blow past a lit school bus stop arm, and a cop sees them, they will get a hefty ticket. Another example, um, school zones. Here in the United States, we have something called school zones, which means... When there's a school nearby, the speed limit drops during certain times of the day because there's kids crossing the street. It's a safety issue. You want to go slow so you can focus better. Um, when my daughter was about six months old, um, uh, yeah, many you're right, many school buses do have cameras, but unfortunately not where I was working at the time. Um, but when my daughter was about six months old, uh, I was having a bad day. It was... It was probably around 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, maybe 8.30, but there was an active school zone in, in the Dallas, Texas area, and I, I, I just wasn't paying attention. And I was going 34 miles an hour in a 20 mile an hour school zone. Now, if it would have been just a regular 14 miles an hour over, the ticket probably wouldn't have been as bad. 
but because I was going 14 miles an hour over the speed limit in a school zone, that was around, that was about a, if I remember correctly, that was a $250 ticket. Why was it so much more? Because I knew the law and I just disobeyed it. I, I knew better and I didn't do better. So I got the punishment for it. So Peter is telling us here that, that those who hear the gospel and they hear the truth that we need to obey God because we love him and you still choose to, 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 to rebel against God, knowingly reject, knowing full well what you're doing, knowingly reject God's law, then he says it would be better that you had never heard it at all because now your accountability has been raised and if you are lost because of your actions, your punishment will be worse than it would have been otherwise. Does following Jesus involve some struggle and self-denial? Luke 9.23 says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. As humans, we are naturally sinful creatures. We have this war with the flesh when we become Christians, and, and there, there's a struggle. It's like you're warring against yourself. Your flesh wants you to go back to whatever particular sin, and, and, and your flesh is strong. It is very strong in the beginning of your Christian walk. Be, you know, you're you're a baby Christian, um, and, and even years down the road, these certain struggles can make your flesh still seem very strong. And Jesus is telling you to deny yourself, to to take up your cross daily and follow Jesus. And my friends, that's not always easy to do. You know, if if you if you're being tempted to go back to a certain thing, especially if you find yourself in a former environment where you used to do a certain sin all the time. It can be very difficult, but it's not impossible. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil, submit to God, or submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Actually, it starts by saying, draw near to God, uh, sum submit to him, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So if we draw near to God, how do we do that through Bible study? Uh, if you watch my sermon that I uploaded to my YouTube channel today called Prepare to Meet Thy God, I talk about that in a lot more detail of how we need to be in Bible study to prepare for the end times now uh, and that's how we submit to God is through his word through prayer now is it safe to procrastinate or postpone a decision to follow Jesus Hebrews 4 7 says today if you will hear his voice harden not your hearts Hebrews 2 verse 3 says how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation 2nd Corinthians 6 verse 2 says behold now is the accepted time behold now is the day of salvation why did the first generation of Israelites, uh, why were they uh, prohibited from entering the Promised Land? God wanted to take them there. And when they finally got to the borders, they were terrified, said, no, we're not going to do it. God says, please do this. Please obey me. They said, no, we're not going to do it. And because they procrastinated in making the decision for God, then God finally had to say, okay, fine, you guys can stay in the desert for 40 years. And then they said, never mind, we're sorry, we'll, we'll do it. And they tried and they failed miserably. You see, uh, and then most of that generation never went into the promised land. There were only two people that did, Joshua and Caleb. Out of probably two or three million people, there were two from that generation that were allowed in the promised land. Now, what benefits come as a result of accepting and following the truth? Uh, Psalm 119 says, uh, in verse 165, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. John 8.32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. First Peter 1.22 says, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. So there is tremendous peace, security, and freedom that you will experience when you follow Jesus wholeheartedly. My friends, we have talked some about some difficult truths tonight. We have talked about some difficult truths in this series. And it's not always easy to accept these truths. I will not sugarcoat this to you. I will not lie to you. If anybody who says the Christian walk is easy, nah, -uh. not always. Some days, but not always. Christianity is not a constant cakewalk. There are good days and easy days, but there are hard days too, and you cannot deny that. But so long as we accept Jesus and choose to obey him and whatever he asks us to do, then we will have peace, freedom, and purity in our lives and my friends it takes bravery it takes courage it takes nothing short of the power of God to live the Christian life in this day and age because most of Christianity doesn't believe in the true Sabbath most of Christianity 
doesn't believe in living healthy and avoiding unclean meats and so many other things and you will eventually be persecuted for your faith whether it's being made fun of at work or whether it's being harassed somewhere else but you will have peace freedom and and purity and security when you follow Jesus wholeheartedly the martyrs of the medieval time period the dark ages uh, they 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 went to their deaths singing now being burned at the stake was a very popular way to die back then it was a very popular form of martyrdom but the reason that the gospel spread so prolifically during that time was because they saw these reformers like John Huss Jerome um, uh, and so many others they saw them go to their deaths William Tyndale singing praises to God these, these reformers were not worried a bit about the punishment they were going to go through because they knew who they believed in they knew that even though they died they would be resurrected to to live forever with Jesus when he comes back a second time and so that's the kind of peace that Jesus offers you if you will simply surrender to him and obey his word because you love him now what question did Peter ask Jesus three times after Jesus uh, Peter had denied Jesus and Jesus was resurrected Peter was probably feeling kind of depressed and so Jesus sought him out personally and and he, he after that fishing miracle that day that Peter realized Jesus was alive again uh, and they, they everybody was back to the shore and everybody was talking and Jesus turns to Peter and he asked him three times uh, in John 21 he says Simon son of Jonas lovest thou me do you love me Jesus says do you, do you love me enough to obey me do you love me enough to surrender fully and Peter said each time says Lord yes you know that I love you yes Lord you know all things you know that I love you and the third time Peter's feelings were hurt and, and he said Lord you know all things you know I love you and each time Jesus said feed my sheep if you love me Jesus says keep my commandments it really is that simple my friends as the Bible says if we claim to know God and choose not to obey him we are liars but if we want peace freedom and security then we need to love the Lord with all our hearts minds and soul and love our neighbors as ourselves that's our study for tonight our next one will be called the road back and that one will be based on Luke 24 that's about the walk to Emmaus so with that said, my friends, I'm going to sign off for the night. I will see you guys. I'm going to try and do one tomorrow morning and again tomorrow night. And, uh, and we'll see how, uh, whenever else we can do that. But for now, guys, you guys have a good night. Have a good rest of the Sabbath, if it's still Sabbath where you are. And if it's not, may, you, may the Lord keep you safely through this next week until the next Sabbath. Good night, my friends.